Good morning and welcome to the Johnson Space Center. Thank you for joining us here this morning for the joint post-flight press conference for the STS-71 and Mir-18 crew members. Now to start the conference and to introduce the rest of the crew members is the commander of STS-71, Navy Captain Robert Hoot Gibson. Hoot. Thank you, Eileen, and welcome to the post-flight press conference for Mir-18 and STS-71. It was a bit of a complex mission, and so I'm sure the debriefing will be done in a little bit of a complex way. Uh, but first, let me start off and introduce the, the two crews that we have here in Houston today. Uh, seated immediately to my right, our mission pilot for SDS-71, Charlie Precord. Next to Charlie, our payload commander and mission specialist number one, Dr. Ellen Baker. Next to Ellen, our flight engineer, mission specialist number two, Dr. Greg Harbaugh. Uh, seated next to Greg, our mission specialist number three, and the Mir-18 backup crew member, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. And then we have the crew of Mir-18, uh, starting with the board engineer, uh, Mr. Gennady Strykalov, the commander of Mir-18, Vladimir Dejurov, and our very own cosmonaut researcher aboard Mir-18, Dr. Norm Thigard. So at this point, I would like to have the, the Mir-18 crew uh, perhaps starting off with uh, Dr. Thigard, uh, discuss MIR-18. Normie? Thanks, Hoot. We actually, as the MIR-18 crew, began uh, training in February, late February of 94. And in the course of uh, about a year, Bonnie and I went through a program that was a combination. It was a combination of the sorts of things we would normally do as a candidate for a whole year just that alone and then at the same time we had to train specifically for the Mir-18 flight. So that made it a little bit intensive but not overly so and uh, we uh, found I think by the time that we were ready to fly we had, uh, we had managed to acquire enough uh, expertise, enough knowledge of the systems of Mir and Soyuz to feel fairly comfortable with the mission. I won't talk a lot about the mission now, I'm sure there'll be questions, but I will say that Veloja told me about a week before the shuttle got there that I had seen more than almost any cosmonaut ever sees because we had gone up on a Soyuz, we had seen the arrival of a Progress resupply ship, we had uh, done several uh, transfers of modules from node to node at the, uh, at the attachment node. And in addition, of course, we had seen the Spectre module come up there and finally the shuttle. At, with that, I think what I'd like to do is go ahead and start in with our slide and our videos. We'll start with the slides first, and we'll, uh, we'll try and give you some commentary. First of all, no, nothing we do ever starts out without uh, the emblem or the patch. That was the Mir-18 patch. We all had a hand in the design of that patch, and so we all, we all feel some ownership for it. It represents, of course, a launch, uh, our launch, Mir-18, from Baikonur in Central Asia docking with the Mir station, the three-month stay, and then finally the arrival of the shuttle and our return to Earth at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The, the first concern I guess I had, because it was long-duration spaceflight and we didn't have any recent experience with it, is what do you need to do by uh, way of exercise to make sure that you're in good shape when you come home? There is an excellent program of physical conditioning on board the Mir station. We had two treadmills and a bicycle. As shown here is the uh, bicycle. And when the Spectre module arrived, of course, we received yet another bicycle. So the space station Mir can adequately provide for uh, physical exercise. And it's my personal feeling, although we are certainly studying it to see if that's true, that the exercise is a benefit uh, for those people when they on fun return to Earth. I have already had experience on the Mir station. However, I had to get used to the station anew. Although the adaptation didn't take much time. That was a very atmosphere that we uh, were used to working on the station. And this slide in particular shows you how we are studying atmosphere parameters. 
uh, was and we were studying contaminations in the atmosphere and quality of the air. I would like to say that station atmosphere practically has not changed for the five years that I have not been on the board of the station. Dr. Thagard and myself were measuring these parameters many times, many times in different points of the station, in different modules, and air quality was always good. We have conducted a great amount of work and a very hard work on board of the Mir station. Especially, it was a very hard work after Spectre module docking to the Mir station. It was necessary for us to activate the module and to prepare it for docking with the shuttle. In order to do that, we had completely replaced and routed necessary number of cables. Also, we prepared the power supply system of the whole complex. We also prepared the station for the docking with Atlantis. It took a large amount of time, but we were able to fulfill this completely, and all of us, Gennady, Norm, and myself, were working on the same tasks at the same time. Also here on the slide, you can see how we were working with the power supply system of the whole station. We have replaced many accumulators on the station, replaced batteries. We were preparing for docking, and we were maintaining the space station. Uh, we're making sure that the work with the shuttle will be sufficient. And this is a very brief minute of rest. Yes, during the day we were uh, getting very tired. And when I saw a guitar that has been on board of the station for many years, I was trying to play some music and Norm Thagard took a picture of me with the guitar. This is also one of the moments on board of the station. Certain systems are close to the creek waters where Norm Thagard was sleeping. In particular, this is a mirror station propulsion, propulsion system control panel. Air quality control system is located here too. Sometimes we had to disturb Norm because we had to work with these systems. He was very understandable, and he was never upset at us. Here my jumpsuit is open. Because this picture was taken prior to Chibik's experiment, and we had to put on the altar 24 hours in advance. And you can see that altar is on at this time. Norm Thagard was 
was making sure that halter is on on time and halter is off on time. This was actually taken, obviously, during the STS-7 joint mission, if I'm not mistaken. I could probably be on that camera there. Uh, but this was, uh, this was a pretty standard uh, view to be seen on station. That is right in front of the dining table we had, and that wound up being pretty much the center of activity. If you needed to write anything down or do planning, and a lot of the experiments I conducted were conducted right from that place. Uh, and also when we held our video conferences during the course of the mission, we were usually pictured just as you see there in front of the, uh, the dining table with the camera looking in that direction. And uh, Veloja and Gennady here uh, are preparing for their EVA, and I saw a lot of this. Uh, there is an actual model of the Mir station, and they would, on the eve of, of the EVAs of their spacewalks, uh, get out the model and discuss among themselves and how they were going to do it, what handrails they would use, what paths they would choose to get there. They had trained it for that, of course, before flight. But by the time the EVAs occurred, it had already been a couple of months, and uh, it was necessary to do these sorts of reviews. And apparently, it worked out very well because the EVAs, of course, were successful. And perhaps Veloja would like to comment a little about uh, EVA preparations. Yes, I completely agree with Norman. Prior to an EVA, we had to model everything and simulate it a few times because with time, after a certain period of time, a certain part, certain details you forget and in order to remember them again, we had to simulate every stage of an EVA on the model. Also, during the whole period of time, we were able to perform five EVAs. The most difficult were the first three EVAs where we had to retract the solar arrays and relocate it with this boom, cargo boom, to another module. And the following deployment of the solar array is as shown on this slide. So it would be able to operate normally within the whole complex, but on a different module. Gennady might want to comment on this one. I found this fascinating. Uh, Gennady basically is using a metal can lid for one of his schematics for work that he has to do. <laughs> we were proposed to perform a job to transfer a part of the power after we relocated the solar arrays to Quant 1 module, we were routing electrical cables for power transfer from this battery to other modules. Sometimes we were using all means, even drawing schematics on such unusual parts. This is a new module. It's shown right after docking with the equipment that came in that module. And as you can see on the slide, we were not even able to unstow it and activate it. This yellow part is a Mirask equipment which is going to be installed by Mir-19 crew by Anatoly Solovyov and Nikolai Budarin when they perform an EVA. And I'm guilty of putting this slide in there. The, the uh, STS-71 crew, crew actually never saw this view. This is the base block, uh, the core module, and it's uh, basically taken from that dining table that you saw before looking toward the central post, which is the post from which the entire complex is controlled. And uh, we went through and did a bit of housekeeping just before the shuttle arrived. But uh, in the course of uh, many months' mission, you do things for convenience. And that is, if you use an object, you place it back in a place that's convenient for you. 
However, uh, because we wanted to uh, be good, good host and uh, present a, a nice, clean station, the 71 crew never saw this because the day before they arrived, we went through, especially Veloja, in the core module and cleaned everything up. And that's uh, the slides. I think we have a bit of a video, perhaps about 15 minutes, so maybe we can go right into the video. And That is the Mir 18 crew, of course. You could see the world, and in the course of three months, we got to see a lot of the world. However, we thought we'd show one that's familiar to a lot of our viewers. That is Houston. We had many passes over Houston. This was one of the better passes. It was almost directly over the city, and as you can see, it's virtually a cloudless day. And as a Floridian, I couldn't resist sticking this one in there. We also had a, a lot of nice passes over Russia. Uh, we didn't get so many good pictures over Russia simply because in those passes, we were usually on communications with uh, Mission Control Center in Moscow. There is, uh, I always wondered how do the cosmonauts come back looking like they're in reasonably uh, good condition and their hair is all neat and everything, and I found out. And Gennady's prices were reasonable, too. <laughs> Один доллар символично. Only one dollar, a symbolic price. Но мне пришлось с пивом с ним расплатиться. I had to pay him with beer for the haircut. Ну этот фрагмент уже все видели. You have seen this picture already. Gennady claims he doesn't play, but actually he did a very nice job. Uh, we did a lot of science during the flight. This was early on, I think, the first metabolic session. We tried to document as much of the, of the science as we could with video. Uh, Gennady, we had to give him a certificate. He's uh, basically a qualified doctor now. He did all of my blood draws, and he did a nice job. There was never a time when we didn't get the blood that we were supposed to get, so I guess that's testimony to his proficiency. We had had, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I ought to fully comment on that or not, <laughs> that was another one of our uh, science experiments uh, which involved a collection of uh, biological samples, and uh, that bag was uh, biological samples floating about in midair. These were some of the uh, air sampling slides. Uh, no, I guess actually these, these are the air sampling slides here. The others were surface sampling. But you can see the mirror station, while clean, uh, still, you can grow a few uh, organisms, fungi and the like, but that would be true uh, almost any place you pick here on Earth. In any event, I can say that uh, no one suffered from any infectious disease during the whole course of the flight. Again, in a little uh, slide, that bicycle I showed you before that I was sitting on could also be used for upper body exercises, just by turning it around, just as Veloja's doing here. Want to come? Especially prior to NVA, we had to work with our hands a lot, so we should we would maintain our operability and save our strength for NVA. We were very often using the ergometer for the hands exercises. Also, twice a day, we were exercising on the treadmill and once on a ergometer. Of course, we were using the expanders also for maintaining our muscular strength. We had to exercise a lot. On the Mir station, you can exercise in two places, on board of the Mir station and also in the Crystal module. There are two treadmills. I mentioned before the Progress uh, resupply vehicle that came up there. This is the Progress, and I apologize. Uh, it probably would have been a lot more spectacular in the daytime. However, the system of docking is fully automated, and it works very well. In fact, it works well enough that you can do it in the light or the dark, depending on which is more convenient. In this case, it was more convenient to do it at dark. So the entire docking sequence, the final approach and docking, were conducted in the dark. I, it, 
it did seem to me, however, that uh, we got some pretty good photos when it got close in, even though it was dark. Now, this is the Mir station as seen from that Progress vehicle. There is a television camera mounted on the Progress, and here it is. At this point, it probably was no more than, I would guess, 25 or 30 feet away. When it actually docked, I took these pictures, but when it actually docked, I was uh, within, I was probably about where Gennady is located there from the docking node. This is the docking node to which the Progress is attached, and we're opening the inner hatch. Uh, I was going to say there was uh, no vibration, nothing sensed or heard uh, during the docking, so it was very gentle. And now you're looking at the docking cone of the Progress vehicle itself. And what we just opened there was, again, a hatch located on the station itself, which is the receiving cone for that docking cone. And it's uh, pretty surprising how easy it is to open all of that and get access. You do have to uh, verify, of course, the pressure seals before you can start opening hatches. All of that went normally. And uh, you have a little tool that you use to uh, unlatch the latch so that you can then open the uh, hatch to the progress vehicle itself. And I think after the hatch opens, uh, you can probably see a little bit of the uh, wares that were stored inside. We each, uh, for our benefit uh, and to our joy, received, I think, about five kilograms a piece of, uh, of candies and foods and photographs and letters, things from home. So the resupply vehicles, everyone looks forward to their arrival. Many of the systems on board the Mir station are regenerable, but there will never be a station, I suspect, completely regenerable. So it's still necessary to send up some supplies uh, to the station using the Progress vehicles. Those things uh, amount to, uh, of course, replenishment of the food supplies, uh, fuel, because the station requires fuel to maintain attitude from time to time, and, uh, and water. And again, we're back into the EVA, so we'll turn this over to Veloja to uh, take you through the EVA sequences. We had to spend a lot of time to prepare the spacesuits for an EVA, to check all systems of the spacesuit before an EVA, and of course Norm has helped us a lot as a third crew member, especially before an EVA when you have to put on the spacesuit. It is very hard to work in it, especially when you have to close the hatch and to perform that kind of works. Always we would put on a spacesuit, Norm would help us, he would close all hatches and then we would start communicate and work outside. Here you can see, this is Gennady Strykalov is on the cargo boom and I'm helping him to move to the modules where the solar arrays were retracted. And on the top there is a box with the tools that you may need at any moment. Usually, when we go EVA, we take with us a little more of tools than we plan on the ground, just in case for some unexpected events. Here you can see certain elements of EVA when we had to fix the cargo boom and move along the cargo boom. Yes, now we were, we are going to retract the solar array. Norman is initiating a command to retract an electrical drive and we're just helping to fold the solar arrays accurately so they would fit into a certain box and fit nicely in that box. No, 
Here you can see how the electric drive itself works. It was not a difficult job to retract the solar arrays. We were just helping the electrical drive. The hard work was after we undocked the solar array from the module and started relocating it. As you see on the end of the cargo boom, you see the battery. Its mass is approximately 800 kilograms. And plus a cosmonaut is on the same cargo boom. And cosmonauts weight together with a space suit is approximately 150 kilograms. Altogether, the mass is usually one ton at the end of the cargo boom. It was hard to control it because there were large moments of inertia, and when you stop to control the cargo boom, it still continues to move. There were very strong oscillation momentums, and it was hard to control them. Well, of course, uh, the public probably actually received more attention or got more attention from the, uh, the docking and uh, the approach. However, I think as you have seen from the video that proceeded before, a lot went on before the shuttle could come up there. Those five EVAs had to take place and had to be successful, and they were. We had to move the modules from uh, node to node because the crystal module needed to be located on what we call the minus X axis because that is the axis to which the shuttle will dock. That all went beautifully, uh, thanks uh, to good help from the soup and to a lot of hard work by Veloja and Gennady. Uh, it's amazing. I could not believe that you could sustain that much of a workload for that long a period of time, but they did, and they did beautifully. However, I think at the last, we were all glad to see the shuttle come up there, and uh, not the least of the reason was just the, sure, the sheer beauty <clears throat> of seeing the shuttle because it is a beautiful vehicle, no question about it. And to look out uh, through a window, someone asked me, well, did you watch the docking on the, on the monitor? And I said, no, I looked at it through the window. And uh, that is a thrill I'll never forget. So we managed to get a lot of good video as the shuttle came up there. At times, actually, uh, the behavior of the shuttle was too good because what happens is the movements are so precise and so uh, control that it looks as though uh, there is no motion and that you're looking at a model and not a real shuttle. I had mentioned before when the progress uh, came up and docked, uh, I heard or felt nothing. When the spectrum module came up, we heard nothing, but we could feel just a very slight vibration. However, in the shuttle, we're looking at a 100-ton vehicle, and when it docked with the station, there was definite motion of the station. And perhaps at the end, you can actually see a little bit of camera motion at the moment of docking. Again, so well controlled that the only way you could tell that there was a relative motion between the station and the shuttle was uh, the vertical tail has uh, tile separation lines, and you could gradually see those uh, tile separation lines dis dis uh, disappear under the docking node on the crystal module. But it was as though uh, we had it on a fishing line and were just slowly reeling it in. Very controlled, very precise. I had thought beforehand that we'd all be a bit nervous looking out and seeing two large objects uh, so close in space, but when you saw how well controlled it was, all of that went away. I don't think any of us were nervous, except Poot might want to comment about sweaty palms or something while he was operating the controls. But from our side, uh, we never had a moment's concern at all. And a smiling face of Charlie even was calming us down even more. <laughs> and I think, it, yes, uh, that was actually the moment because it did move us a little bit and I was trying to brace myself there in the window to stay steady with the photography.